first. Welcome, everyone. Uh, in, in a moment, I'll make sure that everyone on the phone can hear me as well. Let me just uh, do a, a check. There are some of us here at the FCC around a table, and I know there are a number of you on the phone as well, but welcome to our uh, special CAC meeting today. I want to just first check to see if the remote captioner is here, is present. Yes, I am. Excellent. Writing. Uh, and I'm going to first turn things over to Scott to do a roll call. Uh, thank you very much. This is Scott Marshall. And Jeff, we can have a little more volume on the audio out here. That probably would be helpful. I'm, not that much, though. Uh, I'm going to just do a real quick roll call. Uh, just let me know if you're uh, present with us. Uh, AARP, Chris Baker. Uh, American Consumer uh, um, Institute. Steve. Okay. And, and was your, I don't think your mic was on, so just give it a second. For those of us in the room, we have to right. wait for our mics to go on. Okay. Um, American Foundation of the Blind, uh, Paul Schrader. I guess not. Um, Appalachian Regional Commission, uh, Mark Falco. Yes, Mark is on the phone. Hi, Mark. Very definitely on the phone. Uh, Benton Foundation, Cecilia. Present. Okay. Uh, Coleman Institute. Yes, I'm Enid Ablowitz. I'm substituting for Clayton Lewis, and I have with me Clayton's graduate student, Jeffrey Hale. I'll tell you more about him later. Excellent. Thank you very much. Consumer Action, Ken? Uh, yes, I'm here. Consumer Federation of America? Irene? I guess not. Uh, Center for Media Justice? Amalia? I'm on the phone. Great. Uh, CTIA, Scott, you're here? I, I, I know. Scott Burton, okay. Um, Deaf and Hard of Hearing uh, Consumer Advocacy Network? Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Hearing Loss Association of America. Lisa, I think Lisa you're on the phone. Lisa on the phone here. Okay. Um, Media Literacy Project. This uh, is Andrea. Andrea. I'm here. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mitsuko, Montgomery County Office of uh, Broadband and, and, and Cable Services. Here on the phone. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, National uh, Asian uh, uh, American Coalition. Yes, I'm here. Mia. Mia All right, thank you very much. Um, NCTA. Uh, are NC you with? NCTA is here on the phone. Rick Stetson with Stephanie Pody. Okay. Very good. Um, Nasuka, are you with us today? I guess not. The uh, National Consumer Law Center, Olivia, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thanks. Okay. Uh, National Consumers League, I guess you are. Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay. Tracy, uh, Native Public uh, Media. I'm here. Hello. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Rochester Institute of Technology, Raja, are you with us today? I guess not. Uh, speech communications assistance by telephone. Bob, are you with us? Uh, substituting for Becky? Yes, I'm here. All right, thank you. Uh, Time Warner. Uh, uh, Terry Natoli is here. All for right. Fernando LaGuardia. Thank you very much. Uh, T Mobile. Louisa, I know you're here. Yes, Louisa, I'm sitting here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and Mary, Verizon. You, yes, you're I'm here. here. Oh, okay, excellent. Thanks, guys. Uh, we do have a quorum. Madam Excellent. And I did hear uh, at least one beat, maybe a couple of others. Yeah, did anyone, anyone join us? No, uh, Yes, Bob Yaden with the Digital Policy Institute. Oh, Bob, okay. Thank you. And uh, Chris Baker, AARP. All right, Chris. Hey, Scott, I have a question for you. Um, is there a way that you could balance the, the volume for the folks on the phone and the people in the room? 
right now the people on the phone are several um, much louder than the people in the room. Uh, it's the opposite for us, Ken. It's very hard to hear the people on the phone. So uh, we have a little, yeah, we have a problem with the balance, but it's the opposite okay. of your problem. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. And, and we asked the booth to turn you all up right. so we could hear you. Oh. <laughs> so, so sorry okay, about that. Okay, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And, uh, okay, so a, a couple of just a, a, a administrative tasks here. And, and Paul Schroeder just walked in, so welcome, Paul. Hi, Paul. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, oh, and Lawrence Daniels from Nasuka just walked in. Oh, so good. welcome, Lawrence. A couple of things uh, because uh, we have many people on the phone, and it will be uh, difficult to manage this. If you could, uh, number one, always identify yourself when you are speaking so that we can make the uh, this a little easier for everyone. And uh, we will try as, as hard as we can to identify people on the phone. Uh, but uh, please, please, if you do want to speak, make that known if you're on the phone. And if, if anyone uh, does beep in, we'll try and recognize them as well. But glad that we have a quorum. Scott, that's great. And I also want to recognize a special guest who is in the room with us. Uh, Commissioner Clyburn has walked in the room and is seated here and is here to hear what we talk about today. So welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank and you. Angela Cronenberg, who is also, her staff person, is also here today. So thank you so much, both of you, for coming. Okay, we have a busy agenda. Uh, we're, we're chock full of uh, recommendations, so well, let's get right to the work. Uh, for our first recommendation, I'm going to call on Chris Baker from the Broadband Working Group. Chris? Call on Chris Baker from the Broadband Working Group. Chris? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, more, I think Mark DeFalco is going to lead this one. Uh, yes, this is Mark. Um, you know, do you want me to read it, or how do you want to do this? Uh, uh, just go ahead and, and summarize briefly the recommendation uh, if for the group. Everyone has uh, recommendations in, yeah, in, in the their packet. packets yes. in the room, and you had them emailed to you, anyone who's on the phone. So you should have all the recommendations in full. Exactly. And okay, well, this, this is, this is Mark. And then uh, uh, Debbie will just take over for the vote. Okay, the, the, um, the recommendation uh, basically starts off by commending the FCC for its uh, uh, broadband adoption efforts and, and what it's doing on behalf of some of the uh, disadvantaged communities and encourages the FCC uh, to consider that there's more work to be done and to you know look at um, the potential for trying to find a way of helping other disadvantaged organizations and uh, suggests that um, the, the FCC take the lead in uh, holding meetings and uh, sessions, uh, collaboratives with other federal departments and independent agencies who share a same interest in promoting broadband adoption and uh, trying to learn from the best practices of uh, organizations that have been addressing this issue. And then uh, finally to uh, prepare reports uh, on a regular basis to let the Consumer Advisory Committee uh, know what the FCC's progress is regarding broadband adoption, and that is consistent with a uh, recommendation that was in the National Broadband Plan. Thank you. Um, do I hear someone to move the recommendation? Uh, this is Ken McIntyre. I move to adopt. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion? Uh, yes, Paul? We are. Oh, yes, uh, Scott has it right on your left there. Right. <clears throat> Thanks. This, this is Paul Schrader, American Foundation for the Blind. Uh, I just, just curious, it, it doesn't look like there's a lot of uh, specifics in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the recommendations. Um, and I have no problem with this this uh, uh, re this draft resolution at all. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it would actually do that's going to really be beneficial, uh, or to put it another way, if you could maybe describe what would happen in the absence of, of passing this set of recommendations. 
Uh, this is Mark, and I, I believe in the absence. I mean, what the re- what the recommendation is trying to do is encourage more work on broadband adoption, and is throwing out some uh, potential avenues that could be explored in trying to uh, pursue that by having the FCC convene some meetings with uh, constituencies that have been working on this. Uh, you know, for example, the NTIA uh, BTOP program had given out a lot of grants to. Uh, organizations that were geared toward broadband adoption efforts and you know maybe outreach could be done to those organizations and other organizations and other uh, federal agencies that have been working on uh, parallel plans to do things like this um, uh, our rural utilities comes to mind in terms of some of the things they've been doing with broadband and so the suggestion is to you know put the FCC in the driver's seat to try to maybe um, develop some collaboratives that could be put together where ideas could be shared to explore the uh, best practices that have already been found and have already been put out there. And then in, in, uh, in uh, along with what's in the National Broadband Plan, uh, you know, trying to keep the Consumer Advisory Committee up to date on what's being done. So that, that's pretty much it. I mean, it, it, it isn't a very controversial recommendation. It, it's kind of just saying there's a little bit more work to be done, and here's some ideas of how we could continue to move the ball down the road. This, this is Misco Herrera from Montgomery County. Um, but Paul, <coughs> if you look at the second moreover, well, if you look at the second por- moreover paragraph, it, which states that the commission should be encouraged to highlight the important role of regional and local stakeholders without the recommendation, what we see is that national programs and specifically ones based out of Washington, D.C., tend to look for programs that have a national reach at the expense of looking at some programs that may be regionally uh, focused. So, for example, the entire Boston area that are very good, that have partnerships and that are doing the work on the ground, but they get passed over and ignored because they are only in one area and doing a very good job in favor of programs which have a thinner presence in multi-states. Any other questions or discussion? This is Tracy. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, The first, moreover, there's a statement about um, expanding outreach into the broadband Internet ecosystem including specifically non-regulated industries and other stakeholders, um, but you're not specifically listing who those non-regulated industries and other stakeholders are. I'm kind of, that's really nebulous to me. What does that mean? Hello? Yes. I, I think Hello? what... This is Mitzi Herrera. I, I think what we were looking, the, the main goal of that was there are industries that the FCC does not traditionally regulate. And, the, and they, because the commission has generally taken a deregulatory or less regulatory approach with broadband endeavors. The idea was is that you should be talking with them and not just kind of looking within the bureaus to see well, who do I normally have conversations with because I have a regulatory relationship with them? Hi, this is Bob Siegelman, and one of the problems is with people with speech disabilities and multiple disabilities is that they live on SSI. and they can't afford computers to begin with. So broadband access doesn't do them any good. You need some kind of program to get computers to these people. Go ahead. I, I think that from the, this is Mitzi here again, I think that from the committee, that we recognize that income is an issue, but 
and there are many different facets of broadband adoption, but we did want to encourage is that where, the, in large part, the Commission's efforts have been to, there, there has not been any money made available from the federal government to address those. The Commission already has a program in which they have revised the Lifeline program to address broadband, and I think the purpose of this particular recommendation is that for the where they are reaching out to do partnerships, they should look at industries that they do not necessarily have a regulatory relationship with. They should look at local and regional partners, and that they should look at interagency cooperation between themselves. We, we know that the, the inability for many people to afford access is an issue, but because the Commission is looking at that particular issue in other proceedings, we didn't tackle it in this recommendation. That doesn't preclude a future recommendation, but the challenges of income are probably something that need um, more work. This is Enid Ablowitz, Coleman Institute, and I would like to just make a comment. Again, uh, Clayton Lewis, who is your uh, formal member, is on leave right now as our scientist in residence, and he's serving as a consultant to NIDER, the National Institute for Disability and Rehabilitation Research. So I'm an alternate, but I would like to say that we have had many conversations at our national conferences and throughout the years about uh, the, the potential or establishing the right to technology access for people with cognitive disabilities. So in the same vein, when you're talking about other stakeholders, I would like to at least get into the record that one of the stakeholder groups in addition to those with sensory disabilities and physical disabilities are those with cognitive disabilities. So are you suggesting, Ms. Missy, do you want to, in the first moreover, we didn't mention, we just said other stakeholders other than its traditionally regulatory ambit, we didn't mention anything in specifically to types of disabilities, is that the the question that you want to have a mention of other types of disabilities and income issues? I think any time we have an opportunity to insert in the dialogue the uh, potential uh, impact on people with different kinds of disabilities rather than just assuming that disabilities is all inclusive. Most people, when they do think about disabilities, and if you look at the regulations, will look more towards those with physical disabilities and those with sensory disabilities. Those with cognitive disabilities are often let, left out. So I would just simply say that at some level when the FCC, uh, which by the way that we've had representatives from the FCC, including Elizabeth Lyle and Pam Gregory, at our conferences, and this has been under discussion with those folks, that perhaps there is an opportunity to begin to identify this group of stakeholders when people are engaging in a dialogue about um, uh, these issues. Okay, so this is Missy. Um, um, yeah, we do need to. So uh, it, it would, would it be, um, and I do think that we, we did have a, a previous recommendation the last time. I'm, I'm having trouble remember on the broadband group uh, specifically addressing some of these. But if, you, if we added between the first and second moreover paragraphs uh, an additional one that would say, moreover, that the commission should be encouraged to continue and expand outreach to stakeholders who represent low-income Communities and commu or commu uh, communities might need to change, and communities with physical disabilities and cognitive disabilities, or physical and cognitive disabilities. Can, uh, this is Debbie. Uh, I, I, I was wondering. I, Paul Schroeder raised his hand, but I'd also like to hear from uh, um, Chris and Mark on this too. And and we do need to to wrap this up as well. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, this, this is Mark. I was unfortunately knocked off the bridge, so I missed most of the conversation. Um, I did pick up the, the, toward the end of it, and I mean, I don't think we we could um, certainly put some additional language um, that would expand this out. I, I don't know that we want to put in here 
um, every group of the disabled people um, because you know you just would be okay. adding more and more, and then who you don't add um, inadvertently could be left out. But if there was some phraseology that could just uh, encompass, um, you know, whatever, I, I'm I'm fine with it. Paul and, has and a suggestion. This is Chris Baker. Oh, sorry, Chris, go, sorry. go ahead. This, this is Chris Baker, the ARP. Uh, Mitzi referenced the earlier uh, uh, recommendation. Just wanted to, to clarify that was the. Um, no, there are second broadband group uh, recommendation on the um, regarding the the global public inclusive infrastructure initiative mm -hmm. and and uh, our uh, support for that in initiative and, and encouragement that um, the FCC would would take a look at it. So that that does address uh, some of the issues, but it may not be specifically what um, uh, what what we are looking at. This is Paul Schrader with AFB. I was going to suggest a, a solution that might be a, a quick way to resolve, because I had similar issues about uh, 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 language minorities, for example, too, that might not be. In the moreover uh, that Mitzi already referenced a little bit ago, uh, talking about including uh, governmental entities, civil society, so I think that's the second moreover clause, um, I wonder if after civil society we could include organizations representing underrepresented or something of that sort uh, groups. Uh, or groups uh, who, who are underrepresented in broadband adoption, uh, and that ought to get us a whole kettle of uh, important constituencies. I think the, the tenor of this resolution gets to that anyway, but I think it would help all of us feel uh, recognizing that we're, we're telling the Commission quite clearly to reach out not only to uh, state and local and other in the government side who haven't been traditionally included, but also to, to uh, representatives of groups that haven't traditionally been included in these discussions. Yeah, this is Ken Mackle Downey. I think that's a good idea. Okay, so this, this, is, this is Mrs. This is Tracy Morris. I wanted to just say I think that that's a really good idea. Um, it would be great, though, if we could make a reference to tribal governments, too, since they're a separate sort of entity than an organization. Just a thought. Mark and Chris, do you want to accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes, that's fine. Can we be clear on what we're amending? Uh, uh, Paul has an amendment to the second more over. Is that correct, Paul? And you want to add um, add language after including governmental entities and civil society. It would read. Uh, I hadn't, hadn't quite worked out the language. I don't know if somebody else can, but uh, and organizations representing the interest of. Okay, I, I have a suggestion in, in where it says including before governmental entities okay was it first was tribal society is tribal societies the correct term tribal tribal nations tribal nations comma then continue government entities and do we need the civil society we, we probably don't uh okay, this is so Paul Schrader, if we go we with organizations if we replace that with and organizations representing was it persons underrepresented in broadband adoption may, may, underserved or underrepresented uh, underserved communities I think that would probably do it so and organizations representing underserved communities in broadband adoption yes Okay. I think we have draft language. Uh, call the question. What's that, Ken? I'm calling the question. Okay. We're, Ken is calling the question. So we have uh, the uh, recommendation as amended. I think uh, every, hopefully everybody heard the amended language. Uh, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Uh, opposed, please indicate by saying no. Are there any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. Very good. All right. Now, moving on. Uh, recommendations from the Universal Service Working Group. Cecilia Garcia. 
Um, hi. The Universal Service uh, Working Group actually has two recommendations for your consideration. And I'm going to talk about the first one um, regarding outreach for the Lifeline program. And uh, Amalia, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to throw you a curveball here and ask you to help me present the second of the recommendations regarding the um, affordable phone access for incarcerated individuals and families. Uh, so the first one, um, the working group met several times with uh, the FCC staff on the outreach uh, efforts that they were putting forth uh, to um, uh, uh, inform uh, intended recipients of, uh, of the Lifeline uh, low-income subsidy on the changes because, as we know, as we heard here in this room uh, over the last two meetings, significant changes are going on in that program regarding eligibility and so forth. And we, we, we want to start by commending the, the, the commission and the staff for all the work that they're doing. Um, we think that, that it's very laudable. Uh, however, we're concerned that the outreach efforts really are not um, robust enough to, to really uh, help those of us with networks uh, who can help in this effort really get the word out to, to people in, in the most efficient way. So basically what our recommendation calls for is um, we're asking the FCC to uh, take a look at the, the um, the estimated savings that are generated by eliminating duplicative lifeline support. This was reported by the FCC in late July. Uh, we were told that, that a significant amount of money is, is really being saved in that effort. And what we're asking is that the FCC consider, consider taking a small percentage of that, of those savings, and set up a fund that will allow the outreach staff to have money that will help them duplicate and, and distribute the uh, the wonderful materials that they have. Now the, the materials are in English and in Spanish. It appears that the outreach effort is really focused on web outreach and and a lot of in, in, in the course of our conversations with the staff we were saying that a lot of the the grassroots organizations represented on the CAC for example and others uh, may not have the resources to actually go and do the duplication and uh, do the printing and the distribution on, on their limited resources so in order to maximize and, and really leverage the, the reach that, that, that this group and others really has and, and can really extend the outreach, what we're saying is we need to have a little money on the table here, basically, is what we're asking for. So that's what the first recommendation is about. So. Thank you, Cecilia. <coughs> Do I hear a motion to uh, adopt the recommendation? Move to adopt. Ken McElnally. Thank you. Second? Tracy Morris. I'm sorry, who was that? Tracy Morris. Thank you. Data Public Media. Thank you. Discussion? Stephen Posiak? Yeah, I, just for um, for background, could you explain um, about the uh, the savings? Is that savings generated? Um, whose savings is it? Is it industry savings? Is it savings in the FCC's budget that you're referring to? Well, the, on the, as, as you recall, uh, when we were uh, briefed on the, the, the overhaul of the, the, the universal service uh, program, um, uh, the FCC has efforts to reduce duplicate, uh, dupl duplicative uh, um, applications um, and, and has realized significant savings from that. That was in the notice that um, I think was issued in April of this year. Uh, and also in July, uh, there was actually a report uh, generated by the FCC saying that they have already realized a significant uh, amount of savings here. Now, I don't recall exactly where the savings are. are um, just to clarify, uh, there though, were, there I was meant, also some savings. is that budget savings? I just want to understand. I think there was also some savings in the elimination of link-up in the fund as well. Right, link up, okay. Right. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's savings in the... US fund itself. In the fund yeah. itself. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. The right. universal service. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any other discussion or questions? Question. Following the question. Thank you, Ken. Uh, all those in favor of the recommendation signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Say no. Abstentions? 
our stance would be. If you want us to uh, okay, I, he, I have hands in the room. Uh, let, uh, uh, okay, uh, let me say them. Yeah, we have to say them out loud. Yep. Um, Verizon, Mary Crespi, Stephen Posiask, Louisa T-Mobile, and Scott Bergman, CTIA. Anyone on the phone abstaining? Unless there's language that there's also simple language in here, and language is considered to be simplified language, Coleman Institute would have to abstain. Well, you probably would have welcomed that. Um, yeah, Cecilia and I are looking at each other because I think Cecilia would have added that to the recommendation had that been brought up. Well, this is Mitzi. Can we take a friendly amendment from the floor? Sure. Can we still do that? How do we do that? <laughs> we're con we're, con we're con yeah, we're consulting on the on Robert's rules here. Hold on one second. Bob Siegelman, we have the same problem. Who's that? Well, we have to have a motion to reconsider and then reconsider it. So does anyone want to make that motion? Ken Mackel, I move to reconsider. Okay, we will now reconsider the recommendation. Oh, well, we have to vote on that. Okay, do I have a second on the motion? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 In the room? Aye. Okay. All right. So, uh, would you uh, so please propose your language then? I'd like to hear what the other person who says they have a similar issue has to say. This is Bob Siegelman. Um, we need to keep language simple. But a lot of people with speech disabilities who also have cognitive problems. Go ahead. So I'm sorry, this is Mitzi. Is, the, is then the suggestion in the second paragraph, second sentence, the CCAC again recommends, which I'm not sure if this is, again, is appropriate, um, recommends that versions in, and that's where you would make some kind of insert? Uh, this is Coleman Institute again. I'd like uh, to have Jeff uh, Hale who is the Ph.D. student at the University of Colorado Boulder, who is advised by Clayton Lewis, uh, make a comment about this. This is something that he's studied carefully, and he might have a suggestion. Is that permitted? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we said okay. okay. We said sure. Uh, okay. So Thank you. The, the recommendation is in the second paragraph um, for the third sentence where it says, the CAC again recommends that versions in additional languages be posted to provide information on lifetime to the millions of low-income consumers who can't read either English or Spanish. Um, after additional languages, just have an interjection there to say um, including simple language versions. So that would be inclusive of like simple English and simple Spanish for people with cognitive disabilities. Mm -hmm. That would be fine, Bob Siegelman. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is Cecilia. That, thank you very much. That would be fine. And let me just add, uh, I meant to say earlier why we have the again. Previous CACs have brought this issue before the FCC, and that's the reason that we, we this, this isn't a new issue at all, not even within this CAC. So, so Mitzi, that's the reason we have the again. Okay. Thank you. Can, can I ask in the last sentence of that, can we change the can't to cannot? Yes. Yes. Uh, Paul? Paul Schrader with AFB. Uh, one last friendly amendment then at the end, as long as we're amending. Um, effective Lifeline Initiative, delete the period and include uh, and, and add, including in formats accessible to people with disabilities. 
Where is that, Paul? That I'm would sorry. be at the very end of the document. Uh, an effective lifeline outreach initiative, okay. including in formats accessible to people with disabilities. Including in formats accessible. I guess including documents in formats accessible, sorry, to people with disabilities. Paul, this is Mitzi. Can I ask, for people with disabilities, or particularly within in the people with vision disabilities, is it... I mean, it seems to me the crux of this amendment is you want to print things. Right. For people with vision disabilities, do they want things printed? Or, in fact, if you have it on the website and you have a reader, is that a better alternative? So I'm just thinking it, of the budget that, that they have. Right. Paul Schrader, same issue. I think what we're calling for them is to... Uh, is to uh, uh, look at doing this, but I would say the same issue applies. A number of individuals with low income don't have access, ready access to websites, and a fair number are seniors who do have a vi enough vision to read large print, which is an extraordinarily uh, useful format uh, and a fairly cheap one to produce. Braille is, is obviously a more expensive one to produce, and I, I think th the spirit here would be that the FCC look into um, doing, uh, ensuring that part of this uh, effective outreach initiative would include uh, formats that are accessible to people with disabilities. That's going to particularly include vision loss, but I, I wanted to leave it broader because it sort of harkens back to the uh, simple language initiative. Gotcha. But I, I take your point, but I do think uh, large print for sure would be well worth uh, incorporating into this effort. Uh, Cecilia, did you get all that yes, language that Paul added? Okay. Yes, I, 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 and you got it too. Okay. Yeah, I missed I missed a little bit of it. Okay. So, uh, Cecilia, do you take both of those as yes. friendly amendments? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, great. So, any further discussion? If not, let's go to a vote. So, we have the uh, recommendation as amended. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying no. And abstaining. Okay, abstaining, we have Verizon, Mary, Stephen, Posiak, Louisa, T-Mobile, uh, Scott Bergman, CTIA. Yep. Anyone on the phone abstaining? Okay. Cecilia, on to the next one. Thank you. Um, our second uh, recommendation is, is regards the... Um, See, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one here. Yeah, I, there's one in between. <laughs> it's the next one, I think. Okay. Yes, um, regarding affordable phone access for incarcerated individuals and families, um, and I'm going to ask our, my colleague Amalia Deloney to kind of give us a little background and summary on uh, what we have in front of us. Amalia? Sure. So um, I think as many of you know, uh, Center for Media Justice, Native Public Media, Media Literacy Project, who are members of the CAC are really actively involved in this issue, both on um, the committee and outside of the committee, leading national and local campaigns on the issue. Um, for folks who don't know, just sort of a brief rundown, this is an issue that's been before the commission for a long time. Um, it's timely. It's critical for a number of people. Essentially, in 2000, um, the D.C. Prisoners Project and another national cri um, criminal justice organization called CURE filed a case in federal court called Martha Wright versus the, or the Corrections Corporation of America. Um, the case was seeking to reduce the rates that the prisoners' families were paying when they received uh, collect phone calls. Um, it sat in D.C. District Court for about a year, and in 2001, the court then referred it on to the FCC for rulemaking, citing the doctrine of uh, primary jurisdiction. Um, in 2003, a notice of proposed rulemaking was issued, uh, but no action was taken. And then in 2007, an alternative rulemaking proposal was filed, but no action was taken. Um, sorry, you're going to hear a train in the background because I'm in the city. Uh, so essentially, you know, since 2001, this case has been sitting in front of the FCC, um, just sort of waiting to move forward. You know, nationally, we have a number of groups that have come together to really push this issue forward. Obviously, when you start to look at the way the sort of phone um, pricing system is set up, you see that it's very clearly a consumer rights issue. Um, to put it in really simple terms, about 60% of the costs of calls from prison have nothing to do with the actual cost of the phone service provided. 
Um, so when, you know, X person talks to their loved one, whether it's, a, you know, a husband, a wife, a child, you know, about 40% of that cost is service and 60% is a kickback. Um, in real terms, that means that there are a number of people all across the country who are paying um, somewhere between $15 and $18 an hour to make a single phone call uh, to someone who is incarcerated, and that if that phone call is disrupted in the process, they need to then repay that entire fee when the call um, is originated again. You know, there are a lot of reasons why we feel like this is important, um, not the least of which that we have an administration uh, that really believes strongly in issues related to reentry and recidivism. We have a number of people all across the community or corrections spectrum who understand deeply that communications is something that's absolutely critical, not only for keeping people, you know, giving them the best life possible while they're serving their time, um, but preparing them for all of the things that they need to do to when they get out, anything from housing to job security, maintaining relationships with friends and family, um, their lawyers. And then I think for us, you know, really what we're trying to do and, and the sort of consumer aspect that we're trying to lift up with this particular resolution is just the disproportionate effects on friends and family who are actually not incarcerated. And the horrible fees that they're forced to pay, um, you know, is a huge issue for us. You know, we, we end the resolution by saying right what we believe um, is true is that the FCC is the only agency with jurisdiction over long distance rates and that because of that, you know, the Federal Communications um, Commission is the correct uh, venue to solve this problem. So we have submitted the, per the resolution. We've gotten very few edits, which we take to mean that there's huge support for, and um, we'd like to push it forward today. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to adopt? I move to adopt. Thank you, Ken. Second? Andrea Quijada, Media Literacy Project. Thank you. Discussion or questions? Stephen? Yeah. D just a, a, a couple things. One is um, the, the term uh, predatory in the case, typically in, in economics, it means that the price is too low. And I just, when I, when I read that the uh, rates are high and, and, and they're predatory, I, I'm, some, I'm confused as I read this because I think, it, I, I think it's out of place. But the, the, uh, I, I want to get back to um, the, the, the idea that, okay, so if, if prices are reduced, then where did, where did that money, uh, where would that money come from? So is it coming from then a telephone rate base or is it coming from, the, the prison's budget. I just want to know again where the money came from. I'm not, exact, I'm not exactly sure if I understand your question. You're asking if the actual cost of the call is reduced, well, then what happens? Yeah, I mean, the, it's, if, you, if you cut the call price in half, where did the money come from? The price I think of the call. Oh, go ahead. I, I think the question is certainly one of the issues has been that the gouging telephone rates have been used uh, depending on the facility, either to support the facility or for, or for you know, benefits for prisoners. Um, so I think the question is how will that affect the budget for the facility or the extent to which it's going to be for prisoner benefits? Did, did I capture that? So the money, so it, the money goes to the prison budget. Is the answer? Yeah. But, okay. So it, it would come out of the prison's budget. It would. It would come out of the prison's budget, and it's not. You know, it's not as if there aren't um, examples that we can turn to where the prices have been lowered and or capped, um, and things are moving along successfully. So, you know, the market-based argument would be that if you lower the price of a single call, you know, where does that money come from and what is the effect? And on the flip side, there's, you know, the uptake argument that if you lower the cost of the call, you'd actually be able to generate more calls from people rather than less calls because the calls are so high. Um, but regardless, we have eight states that have actually stopped this practice, um, all, uh, many of which um, who are seeing a huge surge in their calls. Um, and, and have and, um, experienced no real uh, impact from this. It's, you know, negative. That's uh, good to hear. Steve, would you feel more comfortable with changing predatory to excessive? 
No, that I mean, I, I just, I, I just, it just kind of threw me as I read it. It's not a big deal, but it, I mean, I think that would um, be better. A, it's a, that's a fine, that's a fine edit. Um, exorbitant, excessive, something like that. You feel more comfortable with? That's fine. We, we'll accept that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, this is Mitzi Herrera from Montgomery County, and I want to, I want to find a way to have Montgomery County on as supporting this, but it's difficult because in, um, well, I agree that there, there's probably evidence out there that shows that some of these rates are, are, are not in line with what the costs are for the calls. Um, and there may be some cases where you have private outsourcing of, of prisons and it's a profit. Um, Montgomery County operates its own jails, and we want to encourage contact with families. Um, so wh what I'm wondering here is in, in, the, um, in the fourth whereas paragraph, is, is there some way to amend that that recognizes the information you provided that you're you, either you, you've got states that um, have capped those rates and you're still able to offer them, or that um, is this the fourth where you're talking about the whereas the predatory rates deter regular telephone contact? That's the one you're looking at. No, it's the one before it. Okay. Where the high cost of calls from inmates often recover revenues paid by telecommunications carriers to states or their correctional departments in the form of commissions. I mean, in a, as a general principle, you know, if you offer a vendor a product and they end up paying you something for it, which offsets your other costs, that in itself is not a, a behavior you have to eradicate. I don't think the argument, and maybe we need to make it more clear, the argument isn't that there can't be some sort of uh, pricing scheme that takes those things into account. We're talking about the fact that 60% profit that's passed on to family members is simply unaffordable for families. And as a result, as a direct result of having to pay those high costs, they are unable to maintain direct contact with people who are in prison. Right, and, and, and I agree with you, and I don't actually, in, the, in where you've urged the commission, I think you've done a very good job of making that clear. But what I'm looking at is in that one particular whereas paragraph. What, um, what would be the suggested uh, sentence or few words that you're thinking of? So what you, what you, against what you're saying here is you're just making the point um, you're, you're making the point that the commissions add to the price of the calls. Yes. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here trying to think of something off, off, right off the bat there to, to to. I mean, because the rest of it. I mean, there's a couple minor things, but the rest of it and the agreements. I don't see a problem with. With uh, somebody who's in the somebody who's in the business of having a jail would necessarily disagree with. It's just that I'm just I'm trying to think how you how you can phrase that in a way that's not quite as inflammatory. Um, could we temper it with reasonable? So if you said if whereas the cost of calls from inmates may be something. I, uh, you're trying to say that where the, you're trying to say that the commissions paid to, whereas the commissions paid by telecommunications carriers to states or their correctional departments may increase the cost of calls from inmates. No, I think I think the issue is that the profit through the commission is so excessive in general that it makes the prisoners' phone calls. Unaffordable for 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 many of them. I don't think there's any question that the commissions are excessive. Well, you already have an example there of eight states where they've capped it. So in those states, I'd assume that commissions are not excessive. Oh, I know. That's 
that's what the goal is, is to I, I, the race. But that's not what this says, that you recognize that in some places that's not. You're saying in this thing that everything is. Oh. May I may I uh, make a suggestion because we are uh, running behind in time here. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if if you want to give this some um, thought, uh, can, we, can we come back at the end of the call? Uh, let's let's go on to the next recommendation. And uh, if you want to just, Mitzi, give it some thought. If you come up with, just think if there's recommended language, look at this and see if you can get your thoughts together. If you have recommended change, fine. If not, we will call the, we will get this back and call the question because we want to move forward. This is Andrea from Media Literacy Project. I do want to point out, though, that it says often recover. It doesn't say always recover. So I think I think the term often actually does address that issue. Uh, this is Bob Siegelman. Before we go on, I wanted people to be aware that one advantage of this recommendation is that it will encourage uh, people not to abuse speech to speech in prison because because there's a lot of able-bodied people using STS in prison because it's an 800 number hmm. and they can avoid cost <laughs> of the call. Oh, wow. Hmm. That's interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, Paul wanted to make one comment before we move on. Paul, Paul Schrader with AFB. I, 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 the ideas and the, the, the point of this resolution are great. I, I'm concerned that I certainly don't know enough as a member of the committee to be able to, to uh, accept a couple of points, the, the terms of the exclusive contracts between prisons and telephone companies, et cetera, and that whereas, the one we've just been debating, the high cost of calls and the issues around that. Um, so, I mean, I don't have enough evidence. I take on faith because I trust my colleagues in the work group that you're bringing something forward that is proven, but I don't know enough to know that. I wonder if, I wonder if those are really critical, though, even to your case. I mean, the case is that the costs are, are unreasonable for the calls for whatever the reason. Your, most of the clauses in your therefore uh, section of the resolution speak to the need for better rates, for uh, debit cards and other forms of payment that... Uh, uh, are, are, are fairer. Um, the one that does speak to uh, specific um, commission issues is clause <laughs> number two in the therefore clause. So I guess here, here's my question: Could you could could this hap, could this be just as well without those two whereas clauses that I mentioned? I think it's the second and third, or, uh, third and fourth rather, uh, for one. And secondly. Um, it seems that it would be helpful to include a whereas clause that says the FCC has failed to act on this issue, which is something I think is critical for this committee to recognize, it sounds like, from what you said. Um, and, and it failed to act, and, and as you note, in the end, it is the proper agency with jurisdiction to, to take action. So I'd be a lot happier if it said that. Would I oppose it? No. But it just, just makes me a little uncomfortable because I honestly don't know and I don't feel like we've heard enough evidence to, to know whether... Uh, the clauses three and four in the whereas sections are ones that we can back up from the committee here. So this is Mitzi again. Then if you, first is, deleting those two whereas paragraphs, is that, would that be acceptable as a friendly amendment? Um, so you're talking about the whereas the terms of the exclusive contract? Yes. And then the following one after that. Um, uh, you know, if we needed to do that to move it forward, I would be comfortable. With that. The, the first one makes me less um, comfortable to remove, but I, but I understand the logic. Um, I think that if we put in uh, the whereas about the, uh, the FCC's failure to act to this point, that strengthens it. 
Um, but I do think that, you know, this point, uh, but yes, yes, short answer, yes, I know we need to move on. Okay, so if you, if you took out those two paragraphs, in the second, whereas, where it says are, can that be changed to may be, since you do have eight states where it's not? Yes. Okay. Although, I mean, I think, you know, now I feel like we're getting into terms of art because they may be, yes. I mean, I think unreasonable is a term of art, but yes, we can change it to maybe. Okay. Then if, it, if unreasonable is still is okay, then in what had been the fifth, whereas, where it says whereas these predatory rates, can we just say whereas these, whereas, whereas unreasonable rates, Can we say excessive, or do we, or should we stay with the unreasonable? Um, excessively unreasonable? I don't. I mean, it, I, somebody else had mentioned about predatory, and I, I think that was a, uh, that that does tend to be more of a loaded term. But I, I would be fine with whereas excessive rates. Yeah, okay, excessive, I think excessive high rate. Unreasonable is a regulatory. I'm sorry, what, I'm getting cut off, or someone got cut off? I think the, I think excessive was the recommendation. Mm -hmm. So whereas excessive rates, and then the place to insert, is, is the fact that the commission hasn't acted, is that going to the resolve, or is that a whereas, in the in the in the last whereas clause, whereas the problem is national in scope and the FCC has failed to take action. Mm -hmm. or, or where so whereas the problem is national in scope and the Federal Communications Commission has you want to say failed to take action or failed to exercise leadership. Take action. Cecilia. Yeah, I think we would prefer fail to take action. Fail to take action to address this issue? I think it can actually just be fail to take action, comma, go into the final, therefore be it resolved. Okay. I agree. And then in the fourth, <coughs> number four, you need the word but. Where is that? You're saying remove the word but? Yeah. Oh, uh huh. Where's oh, the bottom four? number four? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. This number four? Okay. Is that it? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cecilia has them all. Lawrence. Yeah, yeah real quick question. Um, does the FCC regulate the fees, sometimes the administrative charges, handling charges? Is that something the FCC can regulate? Because Oftentimes, they're six or seven dollars just for an administrative charge. That's before you get to the per minute rate. Mm -hmm. So, the, can the FCC, I mean, can they regulate those fees as well? I'm not sure. Amal Amalia, did you hear the question on the, on the administrative? I'm sorry, fees? no, I, I, it got cut out. I didn't hear the middle part. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Lawrence Daniels with Nasuka. I'm wondering whether or not uh, the FCC has the authority to regulate the fees in addition to the rate. Sometimes there are administrative charges or handling charges or some other name like that that can be seven or eight dollars before you even begin to to um, the the per minute rate. And are you saying? And your suggestion is that we look into adding both of those because I think what we want, what we've been working on, and what we want to address is the rate, the overall rate. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. That may be a separate. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so we have a recommendation. Oh, we have another question. Scott? <laughs> but, uh, I, a, a question and just a quick comment, and, and I'll keep it brief. Promise, Debbie. Um, and, and we probably will abstain on this just because we don't typically provide pay phone services and uh, sorts of, I, I guess that, that probably should be my clarification that we're talking about sort of um, collect calls and yeah. pay phones, I assume, things like that. But from the mobile industry perspective, we there's a separate issue, which is we're very concerned with trying to prevent unauthorized. Cell phones. I'm having trouble hearing you guys. Oh. Move the phone. Yeah, let, let me maybe. let me try and start again. Um, 
you know, we're very interested in trying to prevent unauthorized cell phones in prisons and, and very supportive of managed access. So to the extent that uh, rates are more affordable in prisons and that reduces demand for unauthorized cell phones in prisons, we think that's a great thing. But I just wanted to explain why okay. we were uh, abstaining uh, as well, too. And I, like I said, I assume that this is limited to collect calls, pay phones, things like that. So um, like I said, just want to share that. Okay. Very good. I think uh, so. Uh, no further discussion. We this is Andrea for Media Literacy Project. I just want to just say that we are we strongly support this with the work that we're doing, and, and we see the impact on the families that we work with every day around people not being able to have contact with their loved ones. Um, that said, I do think that the whereas clause, while I you know I am I don't know how I feel about taking out the piece that says. The terms of exclusive contracts between prisons and telephone companies routinely, uh, I guess I'm still not clear why we're removing that one. I, I'm, I can reluctantly go along with it, but I, I feel that that's, for me that's a really important piece of the conversations we have here around m having people understand that there's this place of contracts. And, and it is addressed in the therefore, so I'm okay with that, but I think mm -hmm. I, um, it just, I'm a little uncomfortable letting it go. I, I think the issue was we would be comfortable. We need. We don't have any documentation that supports that. We have. We're not saying it doesn't exist. It just hasn't been presented to us. So it's hard to say that we find that to be the case. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, I think we're ready for the question. All those in favor of the recommendation as amended, please say aye. 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 Any uh, opposed? Hearing none, uh, uh, those who abstain? And uh, Scott, we have uh, Verizon, uh, Scott Bergman from CTIA, uh, Louisa T. Mobile. Coleman, who abstains? I'm sorry, say that again. Coleman Institute abstains. Coleman Institute. Absolutely. Was there anyone? NCTA also abstains. NCTA. And, and Time Warner Cable abstains. Time Warner Cable. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Now I turn to uh, Ed Bartholomew for the uh, Consumer Empowerment Working Group. Um, hopefully this will be pretty quick and straightforward. Uh, we got together a recommendation on text spam and, and sent that around to everybody. Uh, the gist of the recommendation is that most of us have cell phones and most of us get text spam and find it to be a nuisance. Um, it is also a burden on the service providers and carriers because they have to transmit the text spam um, and in a similar fashion to email spam, they don't really have a, um, a way to kind of just turn it off and stop it from happening. Um, so they're carrying a burden to push those through and we're carrying the annoyance of having to deal with them. So in light of all that, we thought it would be a good idea to call some attention to some proactive efforts that the carriers and um, CTIA have kind of come together to form that give consumers a, at least, a, I would say, a fighting chance perhaps um, by participating, hopefully. Uh, you know, it, there's an initiative where there can be a database built and, and the end result might be less <laughs> text spam coming through to all of our devices. Um, that's the main push. We also are encouraging the Commission to educate consumers not only about the initiative, but also other text kind of safety tips, <coughs> like, you know, obviously don't respond to text with personal information, don't click on links that might come in uh, on your device through a, a text spam, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and we also encourage them to work with outside groups to get the word out about that. Um, I think I covered everything. Thank you, Ed. This is, this is Ken Macklin. I move to adopt. Thank you, Ken. Second. Second from Scott Bergman. Discussion? Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, <coughs> we will uh, take a vote now. All those in favor, signify aye. by saying aye. 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 
Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? NCTA abstains. NCTA abstains. Time on table abstains. I'm sorry. Say that once again. Time on our table. Time on table Warner. abstains. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much, Ed. You Thanks almost got us back on schedule there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, excellent. Uh, this is Andrea John. from Media Literacy Project. I just I want to make sure I'm understanding. Is everything passing now? I'm, I, it's hard for me to understand like where we're at with the vote. Yes, everything is passing. We have. Uh, if you're looking at our agenda, we are now up to. We have already uh, passed uh, the recommendations of the Broadband Working Group, the Universal Service walk Working Group, Great. and Consumer Empowerment Working Group. Great. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to a special task force that was formed a couple months ago, uh, the, the Consumer Complaints Task Force. And I'm going to call John Brayolt up to the table, who is my colleague from the National Consumers League. Yeah. I want to uh, say a couple things first about this task force. As you know from our last meeting that we held, our last full CAC meeting, we created this task force to... Um, help the uh, Consumer Bureau evaluate their consumer complaints process, and they uh, asked us to have some of our CAC members try out uh, some of their new uh, process. And so we formed a task force, and first I'd like to thank all of those who served on the task force for the time that you spent to do this, and uh, you far ex exceeded my expectations with the time that you spent and with the evaluation that you provided for the complaint process. I think your recommendations were excellent, and you really did spend the time necessary to give this a, a close look over, and as a result, the FCC has gotten some excellent feedback. And now I want to give great thanks to John Brayold, who uh, a, a few weeks into this task force, um, I asked if he might put together some of the feedback that we were providing uh, into a, uh, a chart. And uh, that's what I asked John to do, and it turned into a lot more than just collecting the feedback. And John has served really as a co-chair of this whole process, putting together the feedback, drafting a summary report, and then drafting the recommendation for this task force. So uh, I'm going to turn this over now to John to provide a summary of our recommendation and thank John again for all the hard work that he did. So, John? Hi, it's Oh, before you do that, I'd also like to welcome Bill Friedman to the table. Thank you, uh, Bill, for uh, giving us this task and for working with us on this. And we welcome your thoughts on this as well. So thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello? Okay, good. Uh, hi, uh, everyone on the phone. This is John Brio from the National Consumers League. Um, thank you, Debbie, for the introduction. Um, uh, as, as Debbie mentioned, uh, this was a project that came about uh, due to a request from the FCC staff uh, for input from the CAC uh, into the process they have ongoing uh, to review uh, and improve upon the complaint handling processes that the Commission has. Uh, if you're not familiar with those processes, essentially they are based off of uh, uh, two main components, uh, and those are what the, C the uh, task force looked at. Uh, one was the uh, telephone-based uh, interactive voice response, or IVR, system. Uh, this is a uh, system that consumers access by calling a, a 800, or in this case an 888 number, uh, that where they are provided with uh, not only consumer education information about a variety of topics, areas that the uh, commission handles, uh, but also it's a way for consumers to submit complaints uh, directly to the Commission through uh, a system of live operators. Uh, 
the other uh, main way that consumers uh, interact with the Commission in order to do complaints is through the FCC's uh, Consumer Complaint website, which is uh, FCC.gov slash complaints. Um, and uh, the task force was asked to evaluate both processes uh, and provide uh, recommendations back to uh, the Commission. Uh, we did so uh, through uh, a survey a report, or excuse me, a survey of uh, the 13 members of the uh, task force. Uh, there were two uh, surveys actually. One was uh, uh, of the IVR, uh, where we were asked to uh, actually go in and, and test out the IVR uh, and uh, provide feedback to a standard list of questions. Uh, regarding it and how it can be improved. And then the other was a, uh, a another essentially similar uh, survey where we uh, were asked to evaluate the complaint website, uh, go through an attempt to file complaints, um, and uh, evaluate sort of where there might be confusion uh, or other areas for improvement by the commission. Uh, the task force uh, met by phone three times uh, over the course of, uh, of its work. Uh, and we uh, we also uh, in the results of, of both those meetings and the feedback we got from uh, uh, the two surveys were incorporated into uh, a uh, uh, significant memo uh, that in, where we summarized all the feedback we got that the summer the contents of that memo were presented to uh, Bill Friedman and uh, his staff at a meeting on I believe it was August 16th. Um, uh, so it was, uh, and that was a very, a very good meeting. Um, so the that memo was distilled down into the recommendation that you have in front of you. Uh, the uh, so I will I will go over this in uh, three parts. One will be uh, our recommendations regarding the IVR process. The second will be our recommendations regarding the online complaint process, and then the third will be recommendations regarding complaint handling generally, which didn't fall into, it's basically feedback that the task force had that didn't fall neatly into either category. Uh, so, uh, Debbie, do you want me to go down sort of each bullet and, um, or should we, uh, I can do it, it's no problem. Yeah, I, 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 my guess is it's one pretty much down on paper. I think it's been clarified a lot. I'm not sure we need to go through it in detail, and I think we probably handle all three recommendations. Everybody, and everybody has this, so I okay. don't think we need to go through each one. Sure. Uh, I'd rather see us be open to dis use the time for discussion, and and Bill is here too. So, um, you know, if you if you want to pick out a couple of the sure, uh, just a couple, but I don't think we need to go down. Yeah, I mean, essentially, uh, the high level uh, uh, feedback was that um, the task force members. Uh, wish that it was easier for consumers to actually uh, file a complaint without going through uh, a lot of hoops, without having to go through uh, lots of menus uh, in the IVR system. In the online system, I think the uh, some of the jargon uh, uh, that was in there was off-putting to consumers. Um, uh, similarly, it was all same with, uh, with jargon and wordiness uh, in the um, uh, IVR system. Uh, to a group like us who are who live and breathe communications issues, terms like slamming, DTV, and wireless spectrum management are sort of the coin of the realm. Uh, but to an average consumer, those are those are confusing terms. Um, the uh, reaching a live specialist was a uh, feedback that we heard uh, uh, over and over. The consumers wish it was easier to do so. Um, the uh, separating out consumer-related issues from industry issues. Uh, was another thing that we heard of. Um, the ability uh, of uh, looking to other agencies uh, and the work that they have done in uh, with streamlining their own complaint handling processes, in particular the CFPB uh, and the Federal Trade Commission, uh, were seen as models that the FCC could use uh, in its own work. Uh, and finally, uh, in terms of uh, the, the FCC, uh, complaints are sending them on to industry and, and working more efficiently 
uh, with the industry uh, in getting those complaints resolved was another comment that came through. Um, just to sum it all up, the FCC's uh, uh, enforcement, policy making, and consumer education activities uh, are in large part driven uh, by uh, complaints and what they hear from consumers. So given the importance of these complaints, uh, we thought that it was very important uh, that the Commission take our recommendations uh, seriously uh, and uh, use them to uh, improve uh, its complaint handling process. Excellent. Thank you, John. Uh, a motion to adopt the recommendation? Move to adopt, Ken McElgany. Thank you, Ken. And <laughs> it's my role from, today. It is your role today, Ken. You're fast on the button there. Um, Cecilia, second the uh, recommendation. So discussion and questions. Cheryl? Uh, Cheryl, put your uh, hand up there so we get your mic on. Okay. Did you feel I'll have no? I have one quick question. Have you? Do you have anything that attracted that sort of death filing time between the time the consumer sent in the complaint and how long it waits for them to get a response? Because I know from our community of people with disabilities. It seems I could send a complaint in and do never really get an acknowledgement that it's being worked on and wonder where it went. Um, the, uh, the feedback we got from members of the task force uh, did touch on that. Um, that consumers felt uh, like when they put a complaint into the system that it went into a black hole and they didn't hear back. Um, so I think certainly uh, that did come through uh, in the feedback. Um, it, it is a theme in the uh, summary memo that we produced uh, as part of this process. Um, I'm, I was just looking through the, um, uh, the actual recommendation itself, um, and I don't believe that there is a... Um, Specific uh, recommendation uh, regarding, uh, you know, the the need for the commission to uh, provide personalized feedback to each complaint. Um, so that that issue is not in in the recommendation, but it is certainly uh, a, a concern that we raised in our meeting uh, on the 16th with uh, with the uh, staff and Mr. Friedman's uh, team. That's that's correct. I was going to say that that's a great point, and um, you know, uh, oh, sorry, Scott Bergman again from CTI. Um, just wanted to share with you one of the things that we talked about was how do you get the complaints more quickly from the FCC to providers so that providers can respond more quickly. I mean, one of the certainly one of the themes that you, um, you know everyone in the committee heard was, um, you know, we certainly value our relationships with our customers very highly, and so we want to make them happy, and so. Making sure that we get enough information so that we can respond quickly is great. We certainly hope the FCC Hello, will always. Hello, I'm having trouble hearing again. Could Oop, you please again. speak closer to the mic, please? Sure enough, yeah. So uh, it, um, we certainly value those relationships. We want to make sure that we're able to be responsive as quickly as possible. So um, there's a great memo um, which the FCC saw, which is um, has some really specific suggestions on how to make those things happen more quickly, which is great. And, you know, we certainly hope that, you know, as part of the complaint process, the FCC will always encourage folks to reach out to uh, their providers as well, too, so that they can address questions or concerns before they com become complaints as well, too. So. Any other uh, comments or questions? Paul? Hi. Uh, Hi, this is Paul. Uh, hold on on the phone just one moment. We have someone in the room speaking. I'll get to you in just one second. Paul Schrader, AFB. I, I know I was on the committee, but I never, I still don't quite understand this. So I just maybe with Bill here, we'll, I can understand it. There, the, one of the first recommendations is to complete a, a, a separate IVR system for consumer complaints than from industry-related issues. What are the IVR industry-related issues that are? What is that? Does industry need an IVR system, I guess, is the question. So, uh, sorry, this is um, John from NCL again. Um, you know, 
the industry, as I recall, industry issues uh, that were raised by uh, uh, people responding to the um, uh, uh, the questionnaire um, had to deal with uh, things like, I believe, it was tower siting issues uh, are 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 in there, um, interference issues, um, uh, wireless spectrum management, uh, for example. Um, these are uh, some of the terms that are uh, are used in the IVR system that uh, we thought consumers, you know, just aren't interested in. Um, uh, that are are much more sort of industry focused. Um, the IVR is is a, is also a, a mechanism for uh, folks from the telecommunications industry to raise issues, I believe, to the uh, t to the commission. So uh, the feedback we got was that. Uh, in the interest of uh, making the best use of consumers' time when they do call into the IVR, um, eliminating industry-focused options from it would be uh, beneficial. Does yeah, that answer we, your question? It, it does, Paul. It would seem simpler to just, uh, uh, and maybe this is where we'd go, but to create it. I think industry can find the commission without needing the IVR. Consumers, on the other hand, need the IVR system as a, as a way of facilitating complaints. I, I, I don't know why. It seems like it would be easiest to just eliminate that as, uh, as, a, as an option. It seems like an unnecessary thing to have. Right. Right. I think, I think one of the issues was there is, a, there is a common 800 number for both consumers and the industry. Um, and then you go into the separate IVR. Um, yeah, that may not be clear for the recommendation. That I think it's it's not just a separate IVR, but also a separate 800 number. Uh, was there another question on the f uh, phone before? Yeah, it's Bob Siegelman. Okay, go ahead. One of the problems with the speech-to-speech -speech relay is that a lot of the consumers don't know how to complain. And even if they find out, they have cognitive challenges make it difficult to complain. If we had an 800 number where people could call and talk to an individual, that might make it easier. Go ahead. Um. We... <clears throat> Do we take that? Yeah, I was just going to say we are going to hear from the from the disability rights office shortly about the uh, about the complaint process for the disability community. So uh, we might want to hold and, and incorporate that response into uh, in about ten minutes. John, did you have? Uh, yeah, you know, certainly uh, in in the course of the, the reviewing the feedback we got. On this, um, the issue of access uh, accessibility to the um, complaint system was raised um, in the recommendation before you. Uh, that is uh, addressed somewhat uh, in um, when we discuss uh, the uh, ensuring that the menus and forms in the web complaints uh, uh, process are screen reader compatible. Uh, also, I believe. Um, I'm just verifying this, that there is uh, a recommendation in here about, uh, uh, yeah, in the general complaint handling process that uh, there, the availability of an ASL operator uh, is uh, made, is disclosed more prominently on the FCC's website. Um, I will tell you that in the memo that was presented to staff, there is additional information in there uh, about uh, ways that the complaint handling process could be made uh, uh, more accessible. Um, so it's uh, that that was uh, uh, some feedback that we did communicate to the commission, though um, specific to uh, uh, your question, uh, that was not that is not in the recommendation. Um, but I think, as Debbie mentioned, I think the disability rights. Yeah, we uh, have some folks will, coming to talk to us shortly. We'll address hey, it. Debbie, I'm going to have to jump off for another call. Thank so you, someone, Ken. So, so someone else is going to have to start moving to adopt. 
Fortunately, I don't think we have any other recommendations to move. Oh, good. I'm so not needed. Your job is done. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Ken. <laughs> any other uh, questions, discussion? I, I do want to hear from, uh, give Bill an opportunity to speak to this as well. So, uh, Bill from the Consumer Bureau. Would you like me to do it now or after you, you do the vote? the vote? Oh, sure. Yeah. We can we can take our we might as well take we our have vote. To pass this place. Yes, yeah. let's pass this first. Uh, any any further discussion? I I don't hear. I didn't hear any uh, anything else. So, all those in favor of the recommendation, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Aye. Signify by saying no. Anyone abstaining? Okay, great. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, task force members, and thank you, John, for all your work. Excellent. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm, my name is Bill Friedman. I'm one of the deputy chiefs of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, and it's a pleasure to be here, and we appreciate your invitation to allow us to be here. I would just very much like to thank the committee and the task force in particular, and in particular, John, along with all the other members of the task force, on their incredibly hard and thorough and useful work in evaluating our IVR and our computer interface for receiving complaints. Uh, as I think my colleagues, uh, Deborah Broderson and Sharon Bowers, who's the head of our Consumer Inquiries and Complaints Division, who is on the phone from Gettysburg, and I invite her to provide any comments she may have, but as we articulated to you back in June when we asked you to undertake this task, which you certainly have met in spades, uh, right now we're doing a top-to-bottom review of our entire complaint process, the process by which we receive and handle complaints and inquiries from members of the public. We really have three objectives. One is to make it as consumer-friendly as possible so the maximum number of consumers avail themselves of the process. We literally have operators standing by and we want as many people to call or email us or file complaints on the internet as possible. The second thing that of course we want to do is resolve people's complaints or inquiry requests for information as expeditiously and thoroughly as possible. The third objective in our review is to come up with the most usable data for our bureaus and offices at the Commission that they can use to inform our regulatory actions, be it promulgating new rules, whether it's taking enforcement actions, or highlighting particular practices in the marketplace that warrant our attention. So all the more reason why these recommendations that you've provided us are very, very useful. I can tell you one of your recommendations was that we consult with other government agencies that have similar uh, complaint and inquiry interfaces, like the FTC and the new uh, CFPB. And we are, in fact, doing that actively. In fact, we just had a two-hour meeting at the FTC yesterday that's one of a series of dialogues that we're going to engage in, and we're going to keep doing that. Um, we also recognize the urgency of making this computer inquiry, I'm sorry, this complaint inquiry process as transparent, as usable as possible. And you were good enough to provide us at the August meeting and also recently with a draft of your recommendations. And I'm happy to say that we have already taken action to implement a number of enhancements to the IVR responsive to your recommendations, and I'd just like to outline them. Our hope is, uh, knock on whatever this is, that they will be in place next month. And we have a lot of people working very hard to expedite that. One thing is we heard you loud and clear that people that contact the complaint uh, IVR should be able to uh, reach a live operator as quickly as possible. And we're going to have a, an instruction very early in the IVR message that tells people to press zero and they'll get an operator who will be available to either direct them to the information they need if they're filing a request or they're making a request, an inquiry, 
or if they want to file a complaint, to either take their complaint over the phone or direct them to the place at the FCC's website where they can file a complaint uh, electronically. Secondly, we're adding a message that provides the call center hours for the call, for the call center uh, and also allows people the opportunity to leave a voicemail if they're contacting us after hours. Uh, the third thing that we're doing is uh, we are going to have a dedicated complaint option. So people, consumers who are calling to file a complaint or make an inquiry for information don't have to sit through those particular types of messages on the IVR that deal with industry. And finally, uh, to provide people ease in navigating the various options that we have in our IVR, we're going to have a button that allows people to repeat the various options in the area that they're inquiring so you know they don't have to have a, have a pad of paper and a pen and write everything down. So those are just some of the things that we're doing immediately. With regard to the complaint function, one of the things that we're looking into is whether the forms can be more comprehensible by members of the public. You know, we have a tendency, as you probably know, this place is crawling with lawyers. And we have the tendency to make things as legalese as possible so that they'll be bulletproof from a legal standpoint. But that doesn't do any good for, you know, a, a consumer that can't comprehend what cramming is or what slamming is or what tethering is or whatever. So we're working very, very hard to make the materials that are available to folks that want to avail themselves of our complaint process uh, as, as easy to understand as possible. And I need to warn you, uh, no good deed goes unpunished, and we may be contacting you once we're coming up with language to, you know, pass it by you. You can sort of be our guinea pigs and say, you know, you know here's the three-sentence description. Does this make any sense? Do you have any idea what we're talking about? So we're going to do that. The other thing with regard to the complaint process is there are a number of things that we have to go through in order to do the improvements that we come up with. We've set up right now a team of, I think it's up to 10 or 12 people that are going to be studying this from all kinds of viewpoints. And we want to get this absolutely right. There are uh, Paperwork Reduction Act considerations when we change our complaint forms, and we're going to have to go through that. But at the end of the day, what we hope is that we're going to be coming up with a complaint and inquiry system that achieves all of the three objectives that our review uh, is looking to achieve. And again, we greatly, greatly appreciate the hard work that the task force did. Sharon, I don't know if you're still there, but if you are, do you have any comments? I do. Uh, Sharon Bowers, FCC. I just want to thank the task force for all the hard work and John leading the group, um, the recommendations that you put in place. Uh, we are very anxious and excited to get working on them and get them implemented. As Bill had said, we are already uh, heading in that direction. We've already reached out to our internal contacts to make that happen. And as we look at complaint reform, we're very poised to look at the rest of your uh, suggestions and recommendations. And I just want to, again, thank the committee and thank John for all their hard work. And we are getting started. And I uh, just wanted to show my appreciation and gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. It, uh, it's great to hear that you're jumping right in there and taking some of our uh, early early recommendations pre-passage, pre-vote uh, pre to heart and, and making these changes. So this is great. Um, we uh, The history of the CAC has long been a frustration in having some of our recommendations <laughs> acted on. So. This is great to have our recommendation acted on before it was even voted on. So this is this is great, and we, we look forward to send it, send anything our way because I think that this group is is anxious to get this process right as well. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, I think we will move on to uh, Greg and Susan Kimmel, Gregory. Hill Hillbach and Susan Kimmel.
come join us from the Disability Rights Office to talk about the disability complaints process. <coughs> I think it's probably easier just to take these two mics right here. Oh, do you need to sit? Either way, what, what's easier for you? Whatever is easier for both of you? Do you two want to sit together or? Thank you both for joining us. We appreciate your being here. Uh, Greg, is uh, you are chief of the Disability Rights Office. And we welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon. It's been a while since I was able to talk to the CAC, so thank you for pulling me out of my very dark corner up on the third floor where I've been writing. Thank you very much, Scott, for inviting me to come and uh, give a presentation with one of my right-hand people here, Susan Kimmel, sitting to my right. She is the Deputy Chief of the Disability Rights Office, and she is the one who actually is the hands-on overseer, if you will, of the complaints process in DRO, so the disability-related complaints. Um, again, I'm Chief of, of the Disability Rights Office, so uh, we will have a brief presentation, but I do want to make sure we have uh, time for questions and answers, but please don't let Susan take too many bullets from you guys. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, a lot has been going on. I'm actually very proud of DRO and the Disability Rights Office and our team. We are small but mighty and very productive. First, I just wanted to uh, mention a couple of things. We do have the general complaints procedure and then separate from that, the complaint procedures for the disability related complaints. Uh, DRO uh, is, is uh, obviously the complaints that we handle are niche complaints, if you will, generally, generally fairly specialized complaints. Uh, the other complaints go uh, that are filed with the FCC are handled by the other folks, uh, as Bill was explaining. Your task force obviously recently submitted uh, a draft. We have uh, looked through it. And uh, obviously, you're, you're addressing some of uh, some some general complaints issues, not just necessarily uh, DRO-related complaints. However, most of the issues and the comments and so forth that you raise that apply to the general complaints apply really across the board, including to the complaints that DRO uh, handles. Naturally, we work very closely with CICD in the complaint handling. And we are, are just with the total complaint procedures, including the reviewing and revising, uh, a revamping of the program, of the process. As Bill Friedman before me just emphasized, we strongly believe that there's always room for improvement. There's always room for a revision to make the process as friendly as possible for the consumers. So therefore, we can, we can get the complaints and the inquiries from the public that we need. We also not only want it friendly for the average consumer, we want it as friendly as possible for consumers with disabilities. And keep in mind, consumers with disabilities file general complaints as well, not just complaints related to DRO-related issues, if you will. DRO often gets complaints about just a service disruption of a particular service, whether it be a phone service, et cetera, from a person who happens to be hard of hearing, which has nothing to do with our issues, as opposed to someone who's filing a complaint with a closed caption complaint, for example. Just the fact that the person happens to have a disability doesn't necessarily mean that that particular complaint is gonna to come to our office. However, we usually route them back to the general complaints. 
We want the process to be as simple and, and, and clear as possible. And we want our process to be as clear and simple as possible as the general complaint process. We do need to accommodate persons with uh, disabilities. And part of the, the recommendations would be to prioritize their complaints. So for example, uh, in, in the IVR system, if you have a deaf or hard of hearing person who's calling through a relay system, uh, it's difficult for Relay for them to listen to a laundry list of options before they finally get the specific number they need to press or that the Relay operator needs to press to get to their particular type of complaint. The same can be said for persons with vision disabilities who rely on screen readers. It can be quite difficult to navigate through the FCC's website uh, to go through several navigation panes, if you will, before you finally get to the particular, uh, and, and it, to, to go through information they don't need necessarily before they get to the proper form in order to, to uh, select the proper uh, uh, form that they need to file their complaint. Another point was to identify specific issues, whether it be uh, a consumer who happens to be blind. Uh, we had one particular uh, issue with the 2000C, our current form, and their ability to access the 2000C. Uh, DRO is in the process of, or excuse me, has already speaking, spoken with a particular person, Bob Hashi, Hashi, excuse me, who wrote uh, an article in the Bay Area State Council for the Blind Newsletter. He wrote an article on how to file a complaint with the FCC. He particularly had one uh, for a video description violation. He explained in the article the, the frustrations and difficulties that he experienced when trying to file that complaint through the FCC's website and made some very specific recommendations for improvements. We're hoping to implement such improvements in the near future. He also, in his article, pointed out the difficulty he had navigating the IVR system and trying to get the accurate URL address to get the appropriate web, web form using his screen reader. We're also uh, just to discuss some of the inquiries we've gotten over the last uh, year, from September 2011 to uh, current September 2012, so the last one year period. These are inquiries, not complaints. We got uh, a number of telephone inqu inquiries. Most of them do go to the general CAMS, the Complaint and Mediation <coughs> Specialist, CAMS. During that one year period, there were 1,300 inquiries, disability related in inquiries that the CAMS handled. All, all but three of them were closed. Closed inquiries, so pretty good record. The largest percentage of those particular inquiries, 85% uh, of them, were resolved and handled, again, by the CAMs. Only a small percentage came to uh, DRO specifically. They come to DRO when they require special research or special attention or uh, need uh, special assistance by folks in DRO. The kind of issues that we generally get in inquiries really varies. We have different categories. And the CAMs have various scripts that they can rely on when answering uh, various inquiries, again, fitting certain categories. The scripts vary and generally have a brief summary of the FCC's regulations of that particular issue. And they also generally have an FAQ section because most of the time the inquiries that they're getting have already been answered. And so we try not to reinvent the wheel. However, there are sometimes new or novel issues that come up. And if that happens and they don't have a script to cover it, then it comes to DRO to handle. Some of the subject areas, I mean, I'm not going to go through the, the, the laundry list. I'm just selecting a few out. Some of the subject areas that we specifically handle are inquiries related to video relay service, closed captioning, both for satellite and cable. 
we tally those separately. That's why I, I, miss, I mentioned both categories. We, 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 uh, we, we categorize or tally the cable and satellite inquiries separately. Closed captioning, or excuse me, video description. Video description for both cable and satellite for the same reasons I just mentioned. Deafblind equipment distribution uh, program, hearing aid compatibility, access to emergency information on television. And out of those, by far, the greatest number of inquiries come in for closed captioning. About 30% of our inquiries come in for closed captioning on television. And about 14% of the inquiries are related to uh, telecommunications relay service. The third largest inquiry would be IP relay, Internet Protocol Relay Fraud Inquiries, and it's about 8%. I'll discuss the implications of some of those numbers in just a minute. Now to talk about complaints, I was just explaining about inquiries. Uh, we also obviously handle disability-related complaints, and in the past year, we uh, most of the complaints, again, went directly to the CAMS, but many of them come into the DRO system, our, the complaint system, CCMS, Computer, excuse me, Consumer Complaint Management System. The majority of them are filed online, but many are also faxed, emailed, or uh, sent in through the phone. Folks call in still, and uh, they are tracked in the same way the general inquiries that I just went through are tracked. For September 2011 to September 2012, we uh, DRO handled, uh, well, uh, the number one complaint, uh, you can probably guess what it is, but we received a total of about 741 uh, complaints. And looking at the numbers, most, most of them, almost every single one of them were closed. We had 587 related to closed captioning. That's about 80% of, of, of the total number have, had to do with closed captioning on television. And we closed over 50% of them. The second largest category is telecommunications relay service that includes VRS. We received 287, we closed 263. I would honestly say that the largest percentage of TRS related complaints generally has to do with equipment issues. Uh, a consumer, or, uh, specifically of under video relay service. We also uh, received complaints under the accessibility of equipment and services. We received 104, closed 88. I'm just going through again some of the categories. We're starting to get uh, complaints now under video description since those rules just were re-implemented, if you will. So we have received 22 and closed 15 of those. The complaints that we uh, receive generally are, are in, indicative of what's going on in the world, and we're starting to get new complaints related to the new rules that are going into effect as we speak. But again, no surprise, the majority of complaints overall that we receive in DRO are related to closed captioning on television. And many of them are persistent problems uh, that generally are exacerbated by, uh, that, excuse me, we received more in the past exacerbated by the fact the transition to digital television. The numbers have gone down, but uh, luckily a lot of those issues were resolved because of a task force set up specifically back in 2009 and 2010 to identify some of the issues that were uh, caused by the transition to digital television. A lot of those problems uh, that were technical in nature, however, affected a global uh, affected some global problems, resolved some global problems, but that doesn't mean everything is 100% perfect at this point. 
a lot of the closed captioning problems we handle are very unique, specific to the particular equipment that a consumer may have at home, a specific home uh, setup that a consumer may have at home, and uh, the uh, set-top box that they may have received uh, from their video programming distributor. There's so many elements and so many parts of the problem that it can be often very difficult to diagnose. We have found, however, that the broadcasters, video programming distributors, and uh, programmers have been very pretty responsive, I should say, to the various notices of uh, informal complaint that we serve to them, <coughs> which has helped the issue uh, as well. In fact, the majority of the folks out there uh, during this task force work went at great went to, went to great lengths, went out of their way to help resolve some of the issues, and they continue to do so when we serve complaints on them. Many of them go way out of their way to help a particular individual solve um, their captioning problems. However, that doesn't address the quality of captioning problems that still remain. And we have an open and pending rulemaking dealing with the standards, the quality standards of closed captioning on television, because there really aren't any to this day in place. We often get uh, a lack of complaints about, excuse me, complaints about the lack of closed captioning. Sometimes the issues that they bring to our attention we have no authority over. For example, lack of captioning on DVDs or Netflix. Uh, we, however, respond to them in the form of an inquiry. We're in the process as we speak of implementing the captioning rules. In fact, next week is the first deadline for internet protocol captioning. So we, I'm sure we will see uh, complaints coming in as soon as they go into effect next week. We have tried to identify various trends uh, and, and to help us see if that will give us an indication of what will happen in the future. And that helps us manage our time and resources a lot more efficiently. We're working right now with the folks in Gettysburg to try to change and streamline our serve process. Uh, we're, again, trying to make things more automated to help our time so that we're freed up to handle more complaints and, and there doesn't become a uh, backlog. We're working with Gettysburg to do some more electronic and automatic processing of the notice of informal complaints as well as uh, uh, elect an electronic process on the process, excuse me, on the secure page of the FCC's website. We're trying to eliminate the need for snail mail, uh, which will save on postage, just saves in time, and just also saves staff time because every time we do a snail mail, we have to scan something in by hand into the system, and it just takes quite a bit of time. We are seeing some new trends, however. We're seeing an increasing volume of inquiries about IP relay fraud and just in general inquiries about telecommunications relay service or TRS. Most of them, I think, are based on new rule changes we've had and the fact that we're specifically seeking comment on IP relay fraud and the fraud that's coming from overseas callers. We're doing our best, and we're hoping that the rulemaking that we have going on right now will actually help decrease the number of inquiries we get because we're hoping to actually deal with the fraud. We received, uh, for a period of time, quite a few inquiries related to TRS, because, uh, which the number has dropped now, though, because of rule changes, again, related to the 800 numbers that folks in VRS have, have received, as well as the new certification process we have in place for VRS and IP relay providers. A lot of the inquiries that we, we continue to get, however, in this are just basically folks who call our CAMs for some reason for a status update on their applications. The CAMs have responded to an increasing number of inquiries related to video description. And as you know, um, descriptive video service or, DV, or, or DVS, excuse me, descriptive video service is kind of a new term of art that we're trying to get used to here instead of saying video description. We did receive nine query, inquiries in the fourth quarter of, of this year. We only had four back in the first quarter, so slight increase in that. And 
And then I guess it was up to, I guess, 16 in the third quarter. Excuse me, four in the first quarter, nine in the second, 16 in the third. We're starting to get more and more inquiries about captioning on the Internet because folks are not understanding uh, the new rules that go into effect next week. I quickly wanted to say that uh, DRO is, uh, excuse me, uh, last spring, DRO took a field trip, if you will, up to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, to the call center to talk to the CAMs there and to give presentations on the new rules that had gone into effect or will be going into effect soon. We focused on several areas, for example, video description, the deafblind equipment distribution program, and Internet protocol closed captioning. We're hoping to have more of a collaborative uh, working relationship with the folks in Gettysburg and DRO. We want to make sure that the CAMs are on top of things as, as well because they really are the front line of everything. Even the questions and inquiries that we eventually get, they're still the front line. And so we want to make sure that they are aware of the new rules and regulations that we uh, put in place. DRO is in, in the process right now of, of updating some of the CAMs scripts to include the new information related to the new rules that are have just gone into effect or are going into effect. For example, IP closed captioning, video, video description, and the deafblind equipment distribution program. More will come down the road with advanced communication services and other rulemakings that are still in the process of going into effect. Okay, I've given quite a bit of data to you. I don't know if you guys have any questions for me. I'd be happy to accept any of them. Hi, uh, Paul Schrader, AFB. Thanks, uh, Greg and Susan, for being with us. Um, we'll have, I'm sure, lots of discussion. We are hoping you can join us at a disability work group where I think we can go into much more detail on these issues. But I, I did want to raise a couple of quick questions to you. Uh, first of all, can, can we have a written report of the status of inquiries and all of the things you just talked about in, in, in some fashion that we can review because it's a little tough to follow? Um, I'll just give you all these questions and then you guys can respond. The second one is uh, you talked a lot about close rate, which, which is great, and it's only good, of course, if uh, the consumer is satisfied or if there really wasn't a resolution or it was outside of scope. But if something's closed and, and it wasn't, there wasn't a change and there wasn't a solution, um, we've, we've failed uh, to address the problem. So I'm wondering if in, in discussion closing uh, of complaints, do you also have a category that looks at resolution achieved, change achieved, et cetera? Because as you know, um, a lot of the rules, um, a lot of the issues around Section 255, video description captioning, and the new CVAA all um, unfortunately have perhaps too much driven by complaints, and, and I'm fearing that maybe not enough uh, change is occurring. And then the last thing is that the, the complexity you mentioned um, video description. I don't know when, by the way, it became DVS, but video description um, as the, the, the complexity of trying to investigate or even trying to understand at the CANS level what a consumer is telling them is the problem. It boggles my mind um, as to how you're going to be able to handle, how those complaints are going to be able to be adequately handled. Um, and so if you have any quick thoughts on that, that's something we can probably take up at the task force. But I am interested about written report and uh, whether there's more detail on closure uh, so that we actually know what happened with complaints and by, by uh, status. Sure. Um, Paul, uh, great second and third and fourth question. <laughs> I'll let Susan uh, answer some of them, but I'm, uh, as far as uh, giving you in writing what we went through, I'm happy to do so. Um, I have to just go through a couple proper procedures. I'm, I think it can actually be posted on the web, uh, but if not, it can be distributed to you guys. Just kind of a data report, if you will. Um, I'm sure we can figure out how that can happen. Susan, do you want to take his other questions, or do you want me to? Well, to? Um, I'm happy to give him a try. Uh, what We actually don't have a system now to uh, that, that measures the exact resolution of each complaint. However, we have our own internal processes on this, and particularly such as for closed captioning, we do check back with the consumer to see if what the um, uh, the broadcaster, the VPD, has told us uh, that they've already solved the problem. So we do 
e generally email, sometimes telephone the consumer to uh, see that the resolution has really been effective and don't generally close it until we hear back. And, and in 90, you know, 99% of the time, it has been resolved, meaning that the captions are working okay. We have found sometimes that they stop working a few months later, but that's another story. They file a new complaint. Um, sometimes we don't hear back from the consumer just because we've just, you know, it's just a matter of, of trying to get closing the loop there, uh, and then we end up closing the complaint regardless after several attempts to reach the consumer. So we, we do have our own internal system because, yes, if we want to have success with it. We don't want to just, you know, say we've looked into it and a certain amount of time has passed and now we close it. Now we really do try to get results, and it's very much result-driven, and we really are working on behalf of consumers, particularly people with disabilities. The um, Section 255 complaints are somewhat in its own category, and they are much more difficult to resolve because particularly if it requires innovation of some sort of, you know, not things that have not been, uh, they're not in the market at the moment. Most of the ones that are solved, solvable are things such as um, making certain services available, such as having for someone with vision disabilities, getting um, billing in a format that they can use. So generally the companies have been able to accommodate their consumers, it just might take Linda, a little prodding a little to get that done. The mic, please. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. So, you know, what is considered a solution may vary, um, and it's, our, our system is not fine-grained enough to track all of these different types of situations. Um, but the, I think that's part of what Bill is talking about is how to get meaningful data out of our complaint process because with the volume of complaints, it really what the, Greg's report was trying to show is how the complaints have informed some of the things that we're doing, um, and that's why we spent so much time talking about um, uh, IP relay fraud. It's just, you know, there was a rulemaking that came out of the fact that this was a re repeated complaint. Um, there's, and I was trying, and I th so trying to say that if we can get data that's meaningful for how we process complaints and how we write rules and what other things are on the horizon, what consumers are experiencing, that really is very helpful for the FCC in terms of policy setting and other things. So I, I, your point is very well taken. Um, as for the complexity of dealing with video description, yes, it's because of the, it's, um, the number of hours required quarterly. We haven't quite figured out how to handle complaint within that quarter. I think you might have to wait till the quarter is concluded and then um, get a log of which programming had been uh, complied with the rules to, to demonstrate that it complied with the rules. So we're still working on how our procedure is going to uh, um, be implemented in those complaints. Some of those are being held at the moment. Um, because the first quarter is not over yet. So. Uh, we, we were faced the same issue when we first implemented the closed captioning requirements back in 1998. And uh, we had the benchmarks, you know, that went for periods along the way up until 2006. Um, it's a little bit easier at this point, hopefully, uh, to take action on the closed captioning complaints because we're at 100% with exceptions. We're not there yet with the video description. Um, I agree it would be very cool if we could have, uh, you know, out of the com uh, closed complaints, was the customer satisfied? Were they not satisfied? Or, you know, have it more fine-grained. And on, I, actually the more important part would be the, no, I'm not satisfied part, so we can figure out what we would need to do. Sometimes, however, they're never going to be satisfied because it boils down to a lack of jurisdiction problem. Sometimes we, uh, like for example, with Netflix and video uh, streaming and so forth, Hulu, we've gotten, a, there's a lot of questions of authority that still remain over certain things even though we have rules in place. So sometimes a consumer is never going to be satisfied exactly with, with what we do. Cable providers, uh, I've, we see from the complaints, as Susan was saying, do their best to, to, to go to great lengths, go repeated times to a person's house to deal with their closed caption complaint if it's a very nuanced issue and sometimes it has to be referred to the Enforcement Bureau, and sometimes it just isn't going to get resolved. But, you know, again, sometimes things do also get referred to other places in this commission. 
This is Lisa Hamlin. I know you're running out of time, but I, I just want to add a couple of things here real quickly. First of all, I wanted to make it really clear that the group, the task force that worked on complaints, did not look at disability complaints at all because we were told that was a whole separate thing. So I would really appreciate working with DRO, and I hope you work either with the task force or the whole CAC to look at how disability complaints are, are, how is it going, is it working, what are we finding, and can we work with you to make it better. Um, And I also was not clear at all about, because when I looked online last night uh, for filing complaint under CVAA, there's nothing there online. I don't know if you have something on the IVR system, but if somebody has a captioning complaint under CVAA, it's really not clear for, to me how that's filed. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. This is Susan, and um, we our form is being revised. It's currently being reviewed by OMB, and we hope to have it online by the 30th. So we're keeping our fingers crossed on that. But we are very well aware that the category of these new IP closed captioning complaints does not appear on the current 2000 C form. We will get it up there as soon as we possibly can. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And, and, and I think it, it uh, is a great suggestion for the disability working group to work with you on this issue because we did not address it on our task force, and I think it's important to do that. Uh, Lawrence, did you have a question? Yes, Lawrence Daniels. Um, In your um, process of resolving complaints, if you have to refer a matter to a state commission, um, could you describe that process? Is it smooth? Um, And when you refer it to a state commission, is it considered resolved at that point, or what's the status? when it goes to the state and do you track it to go back to make sure that the state actually um, resolved the matter? This is Greg. Um, We would have considered that not unresolved but closed using our terminology. Often this happens a lot like uh, let's say for example a lack of broadband. We get complaints from folks who who they, they can't get broadband in their area uh, there's just no broadband service providers in the particular area where they live, um, which you know impacts deaf folks too who try to use video relay service. So some, often they're the folks who are filing these complaints. We'll refer them to the state PUC, but for our purposes, they're closed. This is Susan. Uh, yeah, that would apply to other complaints that are referred to outside the FCC, such as ADA complaints. I mean, there are questions about captioning in movie theaters or something like that. It's not an FCC issue, and we refer people to the Department of Justice and to the ADA hotline usually. Okay. Okay. Thank you both very much, Greg and Susan, for coming today. And uh, we look forward to talking to you further about this. So thank you so much. And uh, now uh, we have uh, time on our agenda for any comments from the public. I'm sorry? Oh, thank you. Did he have? Oh, thank you. Are there any comments from the public? No. Do I have a motion to? Well, next meeting. Oh. Next meeting. Oh, okay. Um, Did you want to say? May I? Tell me. Oh. Uh, Scott. Scott? Me? Oh, okay. Fine. I, th- I thought you were recognizing somebody else. Uh, it's uh, Scott Marshall here. There's really another Scott in the world? I'm amazed. Um, yeah, Birdman, that's true. That's, that's true, yeah, exactly. Um, our, our next plenary meeting of CAC is, uh, as you know, uh, November 2nd. Uh, and I realize this will make it difficult for the working groups to process their, their recommendations quickly over the next month. 
Um, I will need to know by August, by October 4th, uh, the sum and substance of any recommendation that you do plan to present. I don't need the text at that time, but in order to satisfy the notice requirements, um, I would appreciate hearing from you by that time. And I know the disability group is already planning a meeting for next week. And if you need any help uh, with with uh, any logistics, just let me know. Thanks. And thank you for a great meeting. It's hard, hard to... Hard to believe uh, that meeting is around the corner, but it is. So uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and I look forward to seeing you in November. Uh, motion to adjourn? Second? So moved. Okay. All those in favor, say aye, and goodbye. Thank you all. Yeah.